Um, this morning, I'd like to talk to you guys about historical trauma. Um, could anybody or all those in here raise their hand who've heard of the term historical trauma? Great. Um, glad to hear that because some of I've met a lot of Native youth today who have not heard of that, um, unfortunately, although it is a big part of our history as Native Americans. And if we're going to work with Native American population, those that are Native American or those that are non-Native, I think it's important that we understand historical trauma and how it impacted Native families today. Um, what is trauma? Has anybody in here ever heard the term trauma? I know on TV some of us have heard the term from uh, medical shows, medical trauma, but the trauma I'm talking about is emotional trauma. Okay. Um, trauma is an event that is overwhelming for a person. It's overwhelming for their ability to cope with, and they don't know how to cope with it, and they cannot cope with it, and they are not able to just get over it. Um, and that's a very simple, very, very simple definition of trauma. Trauma for each person is different, though. Uh, trauma is in the eye of the beholder. For many people, what's traumatic for one may not be traumatic for another. But um, I always like to talk about Maria Yellow Horse Braveheart. She's the first person to coin the term historical trauma for Native Americans. She studied this in the 1980s and was the first person to bring this up and do research on trauma and our history that Native Americans have experienced. Prior to this, nobody really understood or got an idea why Natives are struggling so hard on reservations, in the cities, in the wherever they live. Um, she coined it as the cumulative emotional and psychological wounding over one's lifetime from generation to generation. Um, and she does mean generation to generation. This isn't something that's happened for many of people in one lifetime. It may have happened going back to their parents and grandparents. So we're talking about several generations here when we talk about Native American historical trauma. There are different causes for this, the history of Native Americans in general, which unfortunately is not taught in high school and maybe not even in many college level courses. You kind of have to find this information out. Um, some universities will present this information if they have a Native Studies program. But some of the causes for historical trauma, um, like I title, is complicated. There's many layers, many different sources, many different events that happened. There's government um, causes, there's policies implemented and laws enacted that impacted Native American communities in a very negative way. There's historical events, there's loss of culture, and there's boarding schools. And I'll get to the boarding schools in a little bit, but can anybody in here raise their hand who understands when I say Native American boarding schools, what I'm talking about? Thank you. Before I get to the boarding schools and historical trauma, we really need to talk about traditional Native American life, what it was like prior to the time Europeans arrived, prior to the time of the reservations, when we had a full traditional lifestyle. And when I say traditional lifestyle, um, that means the original cultural knowledge that our tribes lived in, our, our villages lived in. Um, in our traditional life, we had a, a focus of getting along and taking care of one another. And our focus also was to keep the peace. That was learning how to solve problems, learning how to get along, how to work well with one another. Because if you think about it, how many here have experienced the winters in Nebraska and South Dakota? They're rough, they're, they're cold, it's very difficult to survive. We needed to get along in order to survive. So whenever there was a dispute, quickly it was solved. The leaders of the tribe, the families, the elders, they stepped in very quick to resolve the problems and the conflict to prevent much more fighting to happen. We didn't have Walmart back then. You know, we didn't have furnaces, we didn't have refrigerators. So we had to make everything on our own. We had to supply our food for months out. We had to prepare. But this also meant that we had to get along and work together in order for all of us to do this. We had um, bears, we had packs of wolves, we had enemies. So it was very, very important that we got along and worked together. Um, but this also meant that in order for us to prepare 
to survive these winters and to survive just living on the on the reservations, excuse me, on the prairie, um, we had to be very organized. We had to work together, but we had to be great budgeters. We had to be able to um, plan out months ahead to be able to feed our family. Because if we didn't plan out and we weren't organized, we starved. Our children starved. The elders starved. We had to make our own food, uh, clothing by hand. We had to store the food. We had to make our own homes by hand. We made everything by hand. And in many of the tribes, which I found very interesting when I learned about this, was that the women made almost everything by hand, which also meant the women owned everything, the housing, everything that was made by the women. And so we owned property. And so the women's position was, was that of um, a property owner. So their, her level and position of power was highly elevated compared to uh, what people think in history, where they thought, there's a misconception out there that Native women were bought and sold and we were property and the men could do whatever they wanted with them. This is not true. Many of the Native tribes, uh, the women had a very high level of respect and status in the tribes. And in some tribes in the East Coast, the women themselves ran a council that ran the entire tribe. But um, getting back to the traditional life, there's another aspect that I, when I learned about this traditional information, I was very surprised. And it was about how we raised our children. How many in here have heard of how we traditionally raised our children? And I'm speaking from my tribe, the Sioux tribe. But I've spoken to members from the Potawatomi, from the Navajo, from the Crow, um, tribes in California, on the East Coast, West Coast. And they all had one thing in common. Even though we had different languages and we had different cultures and ceremonies, the one thing in common we had was how we raised our children. And they all raised them in the very same way. Um, of the high school kids, I want to ask you, how many have heard of the traditional way of raising children? Um, <laughs> then I guess you don't know. <laughs> no, I'm teasing. Um, in my tribe, the word for children is wakan yeja. Okay, that's a Lakota term. It means sacred people. That's the literal term for children, sacred people. And from this starting point, we raised the children in this manner. We viewed them as sacred people. We treated them this way. When you see something as sacred, you treat it with respect. You treat it with patience. You don't hit. You don't spank. You take your time with these children. Another thing we had in our tribe, in most tribes, was we had children a minimum of five years apart. Five years. We didn't have children in between there, at least in my tribe. And a woman that did, they called her Wiyan Witko, which means crazy woman. Because they knew in order to raise a child in this manner where you have patience and kindness and, and respect for them, you couldn't do that when you have five, six, seven, you know, four kids one after another, because one child takes an immense amount of um, energy. And so they did have a minimum years of five, five years between ch childbirth. But I was surprised to find this because I wasn't raised this way. I wasn't raised this way because my parents had gone through the boarding schools and they weren't raised that way. And I'll get to that in a minute. Um, but with the regard to children, there was no, um, to spank a child was actually very, it was unheard of. And that's a, a traditional way. Of, of raising children. Um, uh, another thing I need to add in there is at about age eight, the children were separated from male and female. The females went with the male, or the females went with females of the tribe, and the males went with the males of the tribe, and they learned their duties of what it was like to be a male or female. But they separated them at age eight if there was brothers and sisters, because they keeping peace in the family was probably the most paramount and important aspect. Do you, any of you in here have a brother or sister that you fight with? Is it knock down drag outs? <laughs> I remember my older brothers and sisters having some um, pretty rough fights in the house, outside the house, anywhere. Um, but they knew that if the, the children fought, it would have a ripple effect throughout the entire family. 
tension would rise. One parent may get really angry with another. Grandparents will step in. How many in here are grandparents or have grandparents that will stand up for you no matter what? Right? Aunts and uncles might step in. Cousins might get upset. So keeping that peace between the brothers and sisters was extremely important. So important that they separated the boys and girls at age eight until, and they weren't allowed to speak to one another. The reason for this though was the environment that the tribes lived in, we lived in a almost a camping environment. Has anybody ever gone camping in here? Right? And it's it's hard because you're in each other's hair. Your elbows are on, you know, bugging each other. So we had a lot of um, social rules to keep that peace going. It's because it'd be very easy to get on each other's nerves and start yelling at each other, especially brothers and sisters. So they had taken that into effect and into account. After age eight, when they hit teenage years, many of the teenagers went to go live with, not went to live, but they spent most of their time with grandparents, aunts and uncles, uh, mentors, because how many teenagers in here, and I'm asking all of you right now, think your parents are so cool. <laughs> really? <laughs> and you listen to everything, they have all the answers, right? <laughs> Well, they did account for that, the fact that many teenagers don't necessarily listen to their parents. Um, and that would cause a lot of problems. It could cause a lot of conflict there. So many of the, the teenagers spent more time with grandparents, aunts, uncles, mentors, because they were more open to hearing what, the, what was to be taught to them. Um, another thing I like to talk about are the, the roles of the men and women. In traditional lifestyle, like I had mentioned earlier, the women had a position of honor and respect. A lot of tribes called them the backbone of the nation, the heart of the home. And like I said, women created, our, they not only created life, but they also literally made everything in the tribe, the homes, the clothing, and they owned property. Males, and this is something I found very interesting because my, my dad went through the boarding schools and he didn't raise me this way. He did later on whenever he learned about our traditional ways. but. Males were very affectionate and very caring and very loving with their children. They were very um, hands-on. It wasn't this stereotype we have out there in the media and in, and in Hollywood of what the males were like. In, in Hollywood, Native American males are these fierce warriors, right? Um, and they would kill or whatever. But traditionally, that wasn't always the main focus of the males. Yes, it was to provide food and protection, but it was to be a good father and to be a good husband and to take care of your relatives. The idea of being a warrior was to take care of each other and provide, make sure there was food, supplies, and we were safe. Yes, of course, Native males were very uh, known for being warrior types, but who wouldn't be if you're thinking your home is invaded? Who wouldn't be willing to step up and defend their family to the death, if need be. Now, another thing I like to get to that I think is very important because today we see a lot of it in Native communities, unfortunately, is domestic violence. Domestic violence was not, was not tolerated in traditional Native families and traditional culture. Domestic violence was not tolerated. If there ever was a, a an event like this, what I had learned from my tribe, what would happen would, if a man ever hit his woman, what would happen is his male relatives would come, take him, take him aside, his uncles, grandparents, um, older relatives, take him aside and teach him what it meant to be a man, what it meant to be a husband. His female relatives would take the woman and take care of her until her wounds healed because he brought a lot of shame on the family. So it, it was a, the whole tribe and the whole community stepped in very quickly to, to settle domestic violence. Because uh, the any, only person that could exact revenge for her would be her brothers. And they could exact revenge in any way they wanted because they were allowed to, because they were her protectors. Um, and I can only speak for my tribe, the closest relationship and the most um, significant relationship that we considered in our tribe was the sibling relationship. It was between sister, sister, brother, brother, or brother and sister. But 
In order for that domestic violence to not spill over into family relations, the tribe did step in quickly to keep that peace, to make sure that it was dealt with in a way that both parties and everybody could feel like there was a, uh, a resolution to it. Basically, I always tell people, um, we had a system that worked. We had a traditional way of life, a traditional societal way that worked, that worked really well. We had means of dealing with domestic violence, which today I think we still struggle with. There's a lot, a lot of place, a lot of long way to go. But we also had a system to, that worked where we knew how to work with each other if we were hurting, if we were grieving, um, if there was problems, we had ceremonies in order to help us to heal. So we had a system that worked. This information I'm teaching you right now, I've, I'm finding that a lot of people don't necessarily know or are not aware of. And that's kind of, that's unfortunate. But there's a reason why this information is not known. And I'll get to that in a bit. Also, moving on. After European contact, obviously some people have heard of the histories of uh, Trail of Tears, where the Eastern tribes were moved, forcibly marched into Oklahoma. Um, but what people don't know is that the Navajos had their version too. They had the Navajo Long Walk where they were marched into reservations too. But there was a lot of events that happened historically, at least 400 years of Indian Wars. There was also disease. Um, many Native Americans, the most populations that were killed was through disease. It wasn't necessarily through war, it was more through diseases that were brought here. Um, there's a long history of events out there that you could easily go on and on and on about that affected Native Americans. And I always put these up here, just a lot of information, I'm not gonna go over all of these. Um, in this timeline of events, there's a list here of different laws that the, the government had enacted, and these, each one of these laws had an effect on every single Native American family out there. These laws um, outlawed our language, they outlawed our religion, they outlawed um, our culture, they dismantled our tribal governments. When you lose a leadership and you lose the ability for groups to lead themselves, you really have a, have a hard time for tribes and people to get up and repair their issues, right? Um, there were certain laws that even at, at one point restricted movement of Native Americans. They could not leave the reservations for a while. And then um, the tribe, what really affected the tribes though was the loss of leadership power and the loss of our ability for our tribe to run <coughs> our traditional governments. And we today, most of Native American tribes do not have our traditional governing, governing style. That was replaced with what we have today, what they call the IRA governments and you'll see in a lot of different reservations. Um, there was a termination act which the Pankas were a part of, but there's many different tribes that were literally just terminated and said, you guys just don't exist anymore, sorry. Um, and then in the 1950s and 60s, which I found really interesting, was that many Native Americans were purposely adopted out of their tribe. It was government policy to take the children that were put in foster care or parents who died they were purposely put with white families because they thought this would civilize natives. They thought this would be the best thing for them. And I've met a lot of people who've been through this project and it was very devastating for, these, for many of these kids. Now the boarding schools, um, you all have heard of the boarding schools, which is, which is really good because it's our history. We need to know this history. And this isn't just Native American history, this is American history. All, need, all Americans need to know this stuff. This is a part of our entire history for the entire country. Now, in the boarding schools, what I found interesting was at the age they had to enter, and it was mandatory that they went to these schools. It was mandatory by law. If they did not attend these schools, starting in about 1889, federal troops could come and take the children and place them in boarding schools. The other thing was that they started at age five. Five. That's, that's a baby, it's very, very young. Um, so separating a five-year-old from their mother, I mean, has anybody seen a kid get separated from their mom in the, in the store and it, how it terrifies them, right? Well, this was, these kids had to go to these schools and live in these schools. Um, the ones that tend to do better in the schools were the ones who went in with brothers and sisters and had relatives there that they could, could um, connect with. 
But the boarding schools wasn't only uh, devastating for the children, it was devastating for the parents, grandparents, um, the communities that were left behind. So for the kids, it was traumatic. It was traumatic for the parents to lose these children, traumatic for the grandparents, aunts, and uncles. Part of the boarding school experience, though, is where we lost that culture that, I'm, that I talked about in the beginning of my presentation, the, the way of raising the children in a manner where we treated them as sacred beings. This wasn't allowed to happen in the boarding schools. In the boarding schools also, we lost a lot of parenting skills, um, how we knew how to raise our kids. There was a, a, a common saying, kill the Indian, save the child. In the boarding schools, they were specifically designed to dismantle the culture. Um, as When the government designed these schools, they really had thought that this was going to be a civil, they were going to civilize the natives and they would improve upon whatever society they had, um, not really understanding the society that we had before, the culture we had before. It was a very, very abusive learning environment in these boarding schools. Um, violence was introduced as punishment, whereas this was never part of our culture to teach on how we taught our kids, how we raised our kids, how we worked with one another, how we solved our problems. It didn't, we didn't um, go into fistfights so readily. So the, and the environment was extremely abusive. And at, at one point, there was about 500 boarding schools in the United, Na United States. <clears throat> one other thing I like to talk about in the boarding schools real quickly is my mom. I have to give an example because it, it really gives a, a kind of an idea of what the effect these boarding schools had on people. My mom and my parents went through the boarding schools. They went to what was called Holy Rosary Mission in South Dakota. Today it's called Red Cloud Indian School. But at the time it was a private Jesuit boarding school. Um, and my mom was, my aunt told this story. She was probably about eight or nine. And every Sunday they would take all the kids into a gym, a gymnasium, and they would put up on, on the wall a movie for the treat, for treat for them for the week. And the movies that back then were usually black and white, right? They're cowboy and Indians movies. This is way back in, I think, the 50s even. And who were the bad guys? Natives, right? Who were the good guys? They were the cowboys. Um, they really had thought they were giving these kids treats. And, the, and my mom and them, they remember whenever they would, at the end of the movie, the, the cowboys would defeat the Indians <coughs> and um, they would all cheer. Everybody would cheer and, and just clap and just be really happy that the cowboys defeated the Indians. My mom would cheer too. And then one day, her, my uncle, her older brother, walked up to her and told her, do you know that's you up there on that screen? You're Indian. And she was, she was taken aback. She was shocked. She started to cry. She's like, that, that's not me. I'm not the bad guy. She actually didn't even really realize she was native. And then when she did, she didn't like it because she was the bad guy. In these schools also, this is where we lost a lot of our languages. Language was outlawed. If you spoke your language, you could be hit and abused and be punished severely. Um, my dad was very fluent in the language, but he would never speak it. I, I don't even remember him saying it, but I know he could speak it. But he learned not to speak it. What I also learned was, in our language, and in most languages and most cultures, if you can speak the language fluently and understand how it's spoken, you have the entire culture, you have the entire information on how to pass that culture on is contained within the language, which is why they outlawed our language. And on top of that, our religious belief systems were outlawed too. Um, and within our, on a, on a side note, within our religious belief systems, our, our spiritual belief systems, our culture was, in, was contained in that also. And within these, um, our spiritual practices and our ceremonies, we had healing ceremonies to help with grief, to help with um, sadness, to help with pain, on how to grieve, how to help one another grieve. So we had effective healing practices traditionally. We took into the account that if the heart was upset, it would affect the mind, and vice versa. If the mind was upset, it would affect the heart. 
And so our ceremonial practices were designed on healing both the heart and the mind. Unfortunately, our ceremonial practices and spiritual practices were outlawed. So whenever we had a huge grieving event, we weren't allowed to grieve. I had heard stories of people who did try to practice their ceremonies, and many of them were taken and put in um, insane asylums at the time and given shock treatment because they were considered insane. And it was outlawed, and they could do that. And many people don't understand that our religious uh, practices were outlawed up until 1978. So after 1979, our ceremonial practices could be practiced in the open. Unfortunately, during that period from like 1889 to 1978, many of our ceremonies were, were gone because they didn't have anybody to, that knew that information anymore to be able to practice them and pass them on. Here's a picture of one of the boarding schools I've seen. Um, I hope you guys in the back can see it. It's really, um, it's kind of small, but it's a picture of one of the, all the kids at one of the schools. Um, if you can see their faces, they're not very happy. You know, they were separated from everything, their identity, their mom, their dad, their culture. They weren't allowed to be who they were naturally. I think it's a very telling picture, unfortunately. So what's the outcome of all these events? Um, what's the outcome of having to live in a boarding school away from your parents not being able to be who you, who you are, not be able to speak your language? Um, when I say unresolved trauma, do you guys understand what I mean? I'm talking to the high school students. Unresolved trauma, yeah. Okay, trauma, like I said, is an event that's overwhelming, that's shocking to the system. Unresolved means it has not been healed. So the outcome of many of these boarding schools and many of the people that came out of these boarding schools had a lot of unresolved trauma. And today we are beginning to understand the impact of trauma on the brain, on the personality, on the body. But this happened to entire generations for several generations. It wasn't one person out of the family. It happened to everybody in the family everybody within entire generations, whole towns, whole reservations, whole nations. So the unresolved trauma, the unresolved grief was never dealt with, was never able to be healed and resolved. Because the ceremonial practice that we did have to help heal that grief, we were not allowed to, to practice it. We weren't allowed to, to heal ourselves. Uh, another outcome for many, many tribes was the culture was dismantled, or at least broken up and disrupted. We weren't allowed to teach the, the culture to each generation that came out, came after them. Many of the people adopted dominant culture, um, but that was a survival mechanism. In order to survive, they, they had to. What could a, a seven, eight-year-old fight back to that? Many of the parents couldn't, couldn't go to the schools and, and <coughs> protect their children. I don't speak fluent Lakota, and I always wish I had. I asked my mom, why don't we speak Lakota? She told me about if you spoke it in the schools, you get hit, you get beat. But she never learned it either. Her mom never taught it to her. So my grandma never taught my mom the Lakota language. And I asked her why. And she's like, because it's the only way she could protect me. She couldn't go in there and, and stop the people from hitting her children. But she could, if she didn't teach them the language, you know, then, then they wouldn't get hit. Colonization is something that happens to people when one group is taken over by another group. That's the term we use. So Native Americans were colonized. We just, we were, that's part of our history. Um, we were oppressed. The term oppression and internalized oppressor is thrown around a lot. But I want to explain this to those in here who, not, who do not understand these terms or may not have ever heard them. Um, internalized oppressor, or oppression, sorry, um, is when you take what happened to you, you make it a part of yourself because you can't really deal with it, you can't fight back, you can't, um, you just kind of have to accept what happened to you, you're just stuck in it. And when you take that, when that happens, and you're in a position where you lost complete power, and you have no power to push back, to fight back, 
because many of the tribes were oppressed. We, we had no ability to control what happened to our kids. We had no ability to even control what we had to eat, and where we could go. Um, when a person is oppressed, they tend to internalize the oppressor, the person who's harming them, and they, the victim, and I would say a lot of times the kids in the boarding schools, had the tendency of becoming like the abuser themselves. They do to others what's been done to them. And I put up their bully. Bully is a very, is a, is a very simple, so easiest way to relate to it. Um, but many natives took in what happened to them and began to act it out, what they experienced, what they grew up in, not necessarily even being able to stop it. Um, and whenever there's internalized oppression and colonization, you see within the communities a lot of violence that begins to emerge in families, in neighborhoods, in towns and cities. If you think of some reservations, I come from Pine Ridge. Any of you in here know Pine Ridge? Okay, Pine Ridge has got a reputation, some good, some bad. We don't have the best re reputation sometimes because there can, there can be a lot of violence there too. Um, with colonization also comes cultural self-hate. Many of the people that took that, that um, oppression and turned it, brought it into themselves. They began to hate themselves. Um, cultural self-hate is with complete loss of power comes despair and self-worth can sink to a level of self-hatred. And it's a, what would happen in the boarding schools is a textbook for a lot of this, a lot of the stuff I'm describing. Um, those, these people who come out with uh, come out of the boarding schools and those with colonization issues or come out with cultural self-hate have a tendency to have low self-esteem. De depression tends to emerge in these communities and in these families. Fear, hate, learned helplessness. You don't able, you're not able to fight back. You kind of just accept it and just deal with it. Addictions you begin to see in the communities. Suicide, domestic violence, horizontal and lateral violence. When I say horizontal and lateral violence, I mean community violence, gang fights, families fighting with each other, brothers, sisters fighting with each other, neighbors fighting with each other, or in the school where you see a lot of aggression. And so I used to wonder when I was a kid, how did we go from that society that I described in the very beginning, that healthy traditional style, to what we see today in many of our communities? Um, not just in the reservations, I work in Omaha, Nebraska, and I work in the native community, and I still see some of this going on in the families, in the cities. Um, so there's a, go from one healthy society to the dysfunction we have right now. There's a reason, there's a huge reason, and it's, our reason has been going on for several hundred, well, since the beginning of the country, honestly, but um, the past century, the government laws that were enacted really helped to cement this, cement these this issues, especially the boarding schools. Um, historical trauma is passed down from one generation to the next. When we see the community violence, when we see the fighting with, amongst each other, you're seeing historical trauma act out. You're seeing trauma act out. Something that was happened to maybe some grandparents, when the grandparents had children, they raised their children, not necessarily having the best parenting skills available to them. So the learning environment for many people who experience, say, these boarding schools, for the children, they grow up with fear, rage, danger, and grief. Some are able to, to deal with it better than others. Family problems of all types emerge in family systems, and for many tribes, culture was effectively dismantled, like I said. We had a traditional culture that would have dealt with this, these uh, disputes, these fights, and the grief. We had a traditional way that would have dealt with this if we were allowed to pass on our culture and our language and our spiritual practices. I always put this up here, the soul wound. There's a psychologist by the name of Eduardo Duran who wrote about colonization and Native American historical trauma, but I like the way he explains it right here. He called it shattering of the spirit, the effects of what happened to us in the boarding schools and the historical trauma and the loss of culture and identity, the loss of language. He, and I, this is how he puts it simply. The U.S. government implemented policies 
whose effect was the systematic destruction of Native American family system, disguised as education to assimilate them to Western society, while at the same time inflicting a wound to the soul of Native American people that is felt in agonizing proportions today. Outcome again. Like I said, we had effective healing practices. We were not able to mourn because all religious practices were outlawed. Um, one thing I always put up here and I talk about is complicated grief. And most natives I've ever met have some, sort of, some form of grief, but they're not, they don't talk about it. Kind of, we're kind of used to just being in it and living with it. Because um, there's a high rate of, um, the mortality rate on the reservations and tribes very high. Life expectancy is very low. Um, and on top of that, there's a lot of other factors, a lot of other accidents that take people's lives. Complicated grief can come from um, the fact that your, your grief, maybe say you lost something and you're not able to express it, not able to heal it. Um, for many people, not all, but for some, complicated grief can turn into depression, major depression. If it becomes long term, it turns into what's called persistent depressive disorder. Before it used to be called dysthymia. And persistent depressive disorder or dysthymia is this low grade depression. It doesn't stop you from getting out of bed, it doesn't stop you from going to work, but you have this sadness and this kind of down feeling that follows you all over the place. You're able to talk and laugh and go dinner, but you're not able to necessarily get really happy. You can somewhat, but there's so many natives I've met that when I describe this, they go, that's me. That's how I feel. That's, that's what I'm going through. And then I ask them, do you know about historical trauma? Do you know about the boarding schools? You know, there's a reason, there's a place this came from. There's, there's, you know, it, it came from somewhere. It's not just who we are. So many uh, Native Americans today are still experiencing unresolved trauma, anger, pain, hurt, and loss that was experienced by parents and grandparents in the boarding schools um, and just being, having gone through living on the reservations, gone through the loss of culture in the past century, race, um, having experienced uh, racism, community violence, addictions, um, and it's passed down through parenting exp uh, experiences. Those that grew up in the boarding school didn't have the, n the best parenting skills, right? And so they will raise the kids the best that they know how or what they experienced. And so even though I did not go through the boarding schools, I consider myself a product of the boarding schools when I began to understand this. I am experiencing this. My parents raised me the way they were raised in the boarding schools. Unless, and then when I realized that, a, a light bulb clicked for me. I need to heal this. I need to work on this. I need to, I need to understand where this is coming from. What happened? How did I get here? Because I was born into it, and it wasn't until somebody explained this to me that that light went off, and I was like, I get it now. I can see where this is coming from. I'm not a bad person. Now, unresolved historical trauma and grief, like I said, can turn into complicated grief. And the um, persistent depressive disorder would be easy to just go along with your day, and you just don't know you're having it. Um, what to do? I always um, talk about what do we do about this then, OK? What, I know what I did. I broke the cycle of violence in my family. I decided I was going to raise my kids as traditionally as I could. I decided I would find out what our traditional parenting practices were. And when I did, I thought, this is great. Why aren't we all raising our kids this way? How come we're not, we're, we're this, well, why? <laughs> How come this isn't happening? This is awesome. Um, so I decided when I had my kids, I was not going to raise them the way I was raised. I was going to work as hard as I could to treat my kids how we used to treat them traditionally before all this, all these events happened. So else, what to do? Learn our history. And this is on the high school students in here and, and the college students in here. We need to learn our history. This is who we are. We don't learn our history, we repeat it. And it will repeat over and over. 
and the violence will continue and the, it will spread like it is right now. Learn our traditional customs in our tribe. We're, uh, our traditional customs are not out, outlawed anymore. But you wouldn't know that because many people are not aware of them. The languages are, are rapidly dying out. If we can learn our languages, you can practice the tradition and the customs. And you can pass on the, the cultural practices. What else can we do is recognize that this is not us. What we are experiencing in our culture, in our tribe, and the violence and the dysfunction that we're seeing in our tribes, this is not us. This is not who we were before Europeans arrived here. We were loving, caring, um, patient, intelligent people that took care of one another. That we made sure the most important thing that happened in the family was to keep the peace and work with one another and support one another. Our traditional ways um, provided for this. Like I said, we had peacemaking practices, we had ceremonial practices, we had ways of solving conflict without taking it to fisticuffs, <laughs> taking it out into the front yard and rolling around. Um, so this is not us. If we didn't have an interference of our culture, you know, our, the traditional society I talked about may still be going on today. Another thing that we can do is we need to, or it would be helpful, is to forgive the past. When I learned about historical trauma, I was very angry. I was mad. I was like, what happened? How could this happen? Um, I was angry that we lost this. We lost this great culture. But at one point, I realized I had to forgive. You know, I had to heal. And in our traditional culture, what I was taught is that our ancestors are always here still. They're watching us. And they're learning. As we learn, they learn. And I also learned as we heal, they heal. So as we learn to forgive the past and heal from our past, our ancestors have the opportunity to heal too. Those that have, have gone on to the spirit world. And so I tell people, let it end with us. Let this cycle end with us and how we raise our children, how we treat one another. Um, and I always tell people, learn what trauma is. Educate yourself. Find out what the effects of trauma is on people. Um, and I, I'm so glad you guys are here. You guys are learning. When you learn more, you know more, you do better. And I tried to keep it under 45 minutes. <laughs> I know we're running out of time. Okay. Um, these are websites for, you can go to, to learn more about historical trauma and learn more about the boarding schools. Um, because the, the information I gave you is just, I'm just touching the surface on information that needs to be taught and known about for the boarding schools and the experiences that we had. So one of his boarding schools, healing.org, there are organizations out there that are dedicated to healing the effects of the boarding schools from what we see today. Um, and discovering our history, dot wisdom of the elders dot org that's in transcending historical trauma we want to heal our people really want to heal and this is these are good resources i'm just leaving up there thank you <laughs>